Welcome, I'm David Eicholtz with David Richard Gallery located in New York City. And today I am with Heather McGill. And we're standing in front of her newest body of work. Her exhibition is on view at the gallery right now. It's called Invisible Bloom. And we will describe that, <laughs> why that uh, uh, title. And um, so Heather's uh, background is very interesting. Um, you studied with Wayne Tebow, so you kind of came out of a, a painting exposure and painting world in Northern California, because right. um, that was at Davis, correct? UC Davis. And, um, but you, your professional career, a lot of it teaching at uh, Cranbrook, for, what was it, about 30 years or so? Or? 26. 26 years. Seemed longer, huh? <laughs> Century. <laughs> but many people probably will know you more for a lot of your, your, th your three-dimensional sculpture, which wasn't always traditional materials per se. You did like being in Cranbrook, which is in Detroit, a suburb of Detroit. Um, you were very much, that whole culture in Cranbrook is very much immersed in the auto industry and the materials. Right. That's where the Eames brothers and a lot of other uh, furniture designers and, and other artists are. So um, diversity of materials and supports is not uncommon. <laughs> and I think there's sort of this energy around there that, that, that sort mm -hmm. of, you, you can't resist not trying to do something, you know, with some of these materials like Bakelite and Lucite and plastics and, and things like that. And so a lot of your sculpture was, was that way as well. And people are wondering, but these look like paintings. And so over the last several years that I've known you, you have sort of moved to, um, well, paper works on paper, you love works on paper, and you have gone to a flatter format, but yet there's still something constructed and sculpted about your works, even if they're sort of in a two-dimensional plane. Mm -hmm. And they're still very much, um, like sewing of beads or layering of other materials like acrylic or plastics on top of the paper or linen or uh, you know, textiles. So you've always had sort of a very wide range of materials and uh, but this move when you moved away from three-dimensional sculptures to sort of doing sort of more dimensional tactile flat work um, was still in keeping with the diversity of materials, correct? That's correct, yes. But why the move to the two-dimensional plane? I guess I got to thinking about that. I thought, well, why did she do that anyway? <laughs> I was trying to remember why did you decide to go to paper in, uh, in supports like that? I was just I'm kind of curious. I think that the thread that runs from, through my whole studio practice is that even when I was making sculptural pieces, uh, they were painted, the surfaces were painted, which is, is, is a little unusual in the field of sculpture, an applied surface to, mm -hmm. um, uh, an applied design or decoration to a sculptural object. Usually the color is inherent or the understanding of the materiality is inherent to the material. Mm -hmm. So it was an easy, um, segue into this work. I wanted to see if I could discuss space and use some of the same processes that I used in making my sculptures, such as always spraying pigment, not actually hand painting. Correct. So everything is, I learned to use automotive surfacers like lacquer and urethane in Detroit area and just continued the process of spraying because it gives a very different look to whatever you put it on. Right. So, right. But also I was a ceramic major at UC Davis and studied with Bob Arneson. I'm sorry, the last part? I studied with Bob Arneson oh, Bob at, Arneson, yes. okay. at UC Davis yes. and so I studied ceramics and, you know, and manual Neri in, in sculpture. It's, it just struck me as you were talking, um, have we ever talked about Nancy Graves? Was she much of a, a colleague or no influence uh, different on you? generation? Yeah, she was yeah. older than you. But yeah. what was interesting when you said you always painted, even though it was sculpture, and that was an interesting thing about Nancy. She painted her sculptures and um, very colorfully, and right. so she, there was always this painting element in her sculpture. 
And interestingly, her paintings and her two-dimensional work were very constructed. I never, I just now put two and two together about you two share that kinship, but yeah, you really didn't know each other. Because she, remember, did like data, like mapping data and things like that. Mm -hmm. That was all collaged on. She did really crazy, wild shaped, huge canvases. Right. She did things protracting out of like metal elements and aluminum elements coming out of some of her canvases. I mean, not all of that at one time, but those are all things she sort of experimented with that made her work. Um, it was a painting format and they had, it read like a painting, but it was collaged, constructed. Um, you know, almost sculpted or embellished, em had lots of embellishments and, and things protruding and coming out so that there was always this, even though it was something flat, there was a dimensionality about it. Yes. And, yes. and you're sort of doing that in these paintings, mm -hmm. which we're going to get to. And I really do think of these as paintings, actually. They I, are, but they do explore and express space. The space may right. not be a kind of a radical space, a large space, but there is a space because you understand the layering. The space is within the picture plane. Something in front is usually rep can be represented, but these are physically built in the sense that they're dimensional. Right. So each image that accumulates to the front is actually a physical layer. Um, and I know paint is physical, but these are different because the surfaces are cast. Right, so that's what we ought to get to so that people understand. I mean, they, they really do, and a lot of people who've come in really are, are quite confident that they're painted. And I don't want you to divulge all your secrets, but to, to your point, there, there are a lot of layers, and this is all built up, so it's a very additive process. Absolutely. But, there's a, but because you sand in between, there's a reveal of... of what was below, but then you, you add on top of it. And you said you, so one of the things is to back up for people who aren't familiar with you is you also love patterning. Yes. And, uh, and textiles. And so, and in particular, you like ready-made textiles, things that you get at Joanne Fabrics and just, you know, everyday fabric stores, nothing, you know, exquisite or anything, um, but it's, it's, it's open lace, it's flowers, be, you know, bees and insects and trees and things like that. So those are the sort of things that you, you were commenting on that are represented. So if you look closely, of course, we probably picked the two worst examples to show that. <laughs> but, um, and the ones over there are a little bit better about that. But when you realize that and you look up at them, there are, these are floral motifs here. So this looks like it was oh, probably like a big tablecloth or something. These are complete flowers. I mean, yeah. this is a budding flower. That's a flower. That's an open flower. So the, the fabrics, they're, I would call them fabrics instead of textiles. Mm -hmm. Textiles have a, a historical reference, basically, or something of value. And as you said, these are definitely big box um, tech fabrics in the sense that they are of the everyday. Mm -hmm. And that's part of the um, iconography that is produced. How is it produced? What is the iconography that people want to wear? Because they're for uh, clothing predominantly women shopping. Yeah, to, or draperies to sew. or, or yeah. shears or something right. like and, that. And some of yeah. that. But very, very little of this is actually drapery material. Almost all of it is actually fabric for clothing. Okay. It's geared towards that, um, that market. So just so people are clear, um, the, these, text, these fabrics that are um, lacy-like, yeah. they're lacy because they're open, uh, they have an open, you know, sort of not weave about them, but a design, and so there's negative space and positive space. Absolutely. In them. And what you do then, so the people are clear, is you lay that these down, and then you add this gel medium. Mm -hmm. And the reason why we pick these two is because if y'all can zoom in here, this actually shows um, the where the gel medium is still pretty raw. Right. You hadn't really s sanded this down, so the people can get get an idea on this one. Um, how tactile it is and how thick it is. And so what you do is, on, on back to this one then, you'll add the gel medium and then you literally lift the template off, the lace off, and then that hardens. Right, it's and like a silk screen almost. Yeah, I literally a modified silk screen. screen, yeah. Right, so I make an armature and then I stretch the fabric and I screen 
the, uh, through the fabric and create a relief that then is painted. With the auto lacquer and it's sprayed? Well, actually, these are water-based. Everything I'm using today is water-based, so it's an acrylic-based paint. Oh, okay. And, but I, all my skills are with urethane and lacquer. You're right. By living in Detroit, I accessed um, the automotive. Uh, you know, the technique of the automotive. And just step back a minute though, because even in the auto industry, at least back in the 60s and 70s and early days when they were doing the, the, um, those rally stripes on cars, you, when you went to some of these shops, these auto shops, you realized they were actually using women's lace and lacquering over those to create those patterns, correct? Yeah, that's a historical, uh, predominantly from the 70s. Yeah, um, that one that was really popular. A lot of yeah. customizing, so this wouldn't be production cars from, they oh, would right, be cars right. originally from Ford, but these were all um, custom cars. And the 70s uh, embraced the geometric design of the car and would lay lace down on the hood on the top of the car, the sides of the car, and they would spray lacquer through it. And it wouldn't be in production, it would just be customized. Right. And I saw that at a, a, a custom um, fair in Houston, Texas, and it just, <laughs> I was mind blown. <laughs> but what's interesting though is then the, the uh, acrylic medium or uh, paint sort of puddles around on this and, and dries, and then when you sand through, you're going through the gel and... Many layers of right. uh, the, paint, the paint that's laid down, day after day I, I add many layers of um, the acrylic paint. So it's both an additive process, but what is just as significant is the subtractive aspect of it, where I'm using a random orbital and then hand sanding, so I'm laying all this paint up to equal the surface of the, the cast area, and then I'm sanding down to reveal and try to find the image and the coloration and the pattern through that. So um, it's very important that both of those are embraced. It's in, in its, the interest for me as an artist is that you don't know what you have until you start working with it and you can never predict in the future you can't lay out a canvas. So in many ways, piece. these are also process paintings. They're so processed, yes. and there's always a reveal. Yeah. There's a moment where there's a reveal where you understand visually that you've reached something mm -hmm. and you want to keep it. Mm -hmm. um, and then I add more layers and more stencils and all of that to, to build up multiple different patterns. So it's both. So, and that's what sort of makes them, that's why even though you use processes that we would typically think of in your, your mindset and approach of how you do these is sort of a construction yes. in production like you would with a yes. sculpture. At the end of the day though, your rationale and what you're doing is many, is many of the things that are expressed for painting. So you really are sort of moving back and forth between mm. these, these two different um, you know, approaches to art making. Right. So there's this, and, and while these aren't as dimensional per se, uh, but you did sort of do something different this time with the, uh, sometimes you would normally, you would just do a frame for your, your work. You would frame it right. in some fashion. The work on paper. Correct. Yes. And so there was always a framing device. Yes. But now what you're doing is actually adding these borders. So for people who can't see maybe, maybe this one's a little better from the angle of the, of the camera. But these are very dimensional, and the sides of everything is painted. Everything is cast. So the surface and the sides and everything are cast and, and, and all the same. You're just using contrasting sort of colors to sort of highlight them. But mm -hmm. these do have a dimensionality now. And, Definitely. You know, which is a little bit different. And so um, they're not as pro projecting out as even some of your wall sculptures, you know, which some of your wall sculptures back then would come like way all the way out to like here. Exactly. These still read very much like a painting. Mm -hmm. So um, these I think have approached probably being the most painting like, but probably just as much of a rigorous sort of building type process or constructing process as any of your other work. Absolutely, they're the same yeah. for me. Uh, when I started using lacquer and urethane, 
uh, one of the beautiful things about using paints is that, and you're spraying them, is the moment of engagement with the object. Mm -hmm. So it's your hand pulling the trigger with fluid in it and going across the surface. Mm -hmm. And there's a moment where uh, your mind, your eye, your body are in sync to make a perfect pass of a coloration. Right. And so everything from the point I discovered that in the piece, in, in building art, I w wanted to make sure that that was always part of how I made my work. Mm -hmm. So that's why the subtractive and also continuing to spray, I really want that moment of engagement of all parts of my body and the materiality. Mm -hmm. um, it, it really is a different moment. <laughs> it's, right. Um, you know, so it was very important to me. But the other sort of reference that these have to me that I immediately thought of was, I think most people probably will too, is, is Howard Hodgkin. Mm -hmm. and yes, with pa the painted frame. Yeah, the painting of the frame. Yes. And so one of the things I kind of want to get to using that as sort of the entry, and not that you were emulating that at all. In fact, I'm not even sure that passed through your mind when you were doing it. You no. just did them as a frame. But I, I sort of read them, not the same as his, his, but you know, one of the things with him was is his paintings is he went from figuration and representational to abstraction. It was more about the sort of the uh, emotional state or you know, that whole fluidity of his moving to abstraction and um, the sort of the sensations. And so that's one yes. of the things I'm kind of curious about your work because your work all has um, this sort of uh, trippy, psychedelic, lots of layering and, and density you know, in it. And just like most psychedelia, it pulls from a lot of things. Patterning, surrealism, you know, um, indigenous, uh, you know, textiles and, 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 you know, palettes and things like that, as well as very experimental with fluorescence and, uh, you know, and, but bringing all that together in one body and using text, you know, um, often using text because you know, they were in the rock posters and things like that. So, uh, but, um, so in your work, what I'm trying to figure out is, I'm not sure we ever talked about that, but where does that sort of uh, interest in, in that density and layering and sort of the, the this sort of almost um, psychedelic aspect come from? I mean, do, do you, is it a conscious thing or does it just become sort of the result because you get so much into the process and the patterning? I think it's both, but I want to go back a little bit because at UC Davis, Roy DeForest taught there. Mm -hmm. And Roy is an artist who works with the frame, where the frame is a continuum of the content. So he's talking about yeah, the point. content in the center yeah. and then how does the painting edge end and where does it end? And, and so we could talk about these as frames, but we could also talk about them as a continuation, a kind of mark made that pulls you back into the, the, the piece. So, Which was sort of how Hodgkin's was. They, definitely. It was sort of always pushing the edge of the piece and just, then just enveloping it into the, the frame. Yes, and so that you're pushing imagery back into itself. Right. And I'm very interested in one of the outcomes of using so much pattern is that pattern is representative or can be misread as representative of cultures, but it is such a mashup for hundreds and hundreds ever since groups of people um, began trading with each other, iconography became fluid. Mm -hmm. And it's very difficult to find a pattern that represents a group of people. Just a single culture. Because so people always borrow and... Everything you know. is a mashup. So whenever you use fabric and print, um, you're looking at many different, um, different representations simultaneously mixed up. And that's, there are no rules about that because the fabric just keeps changing annually or seasonally in in inexpensive fabric world mm -hmm. at say Joanne's or whatever. Yeah. It's always turning. So you have to run through a lot so of different images to make sales. But when you're using it as a pattern in a piece, you're gonna have a, everything from Asian to European to African. So you're going to be representing all of these things simultaneously without singular uh, identity or ownership mm -hmm. because it becomes a fluid language and uh, that's why I think this work 
has a psychedelic quality. I think you have a lot of things that, ways groups of people have historically worked that aren't, that are now being pushed in, right. and merged into each other. But there's also the natural world is a big element of your work too, because yeah. the fact that you've always focused on fabrics that have floral motifs and insects I'm drawn and bugs. To, I'm and, drawn to those. Yeah, and in yeah. fact, you see a lot of that, like in that picture there, we already talked about it. Um, with the flowers. This other one over here, which has a, a new little twist in it too, which was metallic paint. Yeah. But this one has a lot of very clear plants in it. Yes. Um, so like, <laughs> like branches and like flowers with the stem and the head. And there's just a, a, a lot of, when you look at this one, it's very abstracted and very interesting, the palette. But um, you can very clearly see that it's very botanical. Yes. And um, I think a few of them, the one there, there's a few Yeah, others. several of them, you can really see the floral motifs when you come up close. Some of them get so abstracted, like right. this one. Um, and then these emblems, because some of them have these, these sort of emblems, like this one now has these little medallions um, sort of in them from the gel medium mm. that you left orange. So these have a different sort of read. Um, this one feels very snakeskin-like, of these, these fragments. Um, so this one's a very interesting imagery, because it, it is very... The ground has a lot of very distinct patterns that you see, like these sort of, you know, wheels, pinwheels, that could be read as like a, a 1960s sort of stylized flower or something like that. But then there's these other elements here that are very fragmented and very interesting. What it, What's the origin? I of actually this? think that the the orange fabric, um, which I actually brought in, bought in Detroit, um, is a is a deco derivative to look deco. If mm. you saw the fabric in totality, it would be deco. Um, the yellow area, yellow and blue, is actually um, taken from the representation of a rose or a flower off. Uh, restaurant wear. So restaurant wear, the airbrushed restaurant wear, mm -hmm. uh, many people collect it today. Right. And I took, scan that rose, and I do use, you know, technology to You're take You're talking some. about this element. This is actually a rose that's been cut into slices oh, and reconfigured. Oh, yes, 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 yes. So now this I is completely floral. And actually this shape is floral, but the deco um, but it sort of has this feel of like a bird. Oh yes, with and that surprising its wings. It surprised me as much as it did. I had no idea. So the way I achieve that is I I do cast the surface. I see. So it's a, but it's bisected. This was the bud right here. Yes. I, yeah. And these are the little yeah, yeah. bracts. Yeah. Oh, I'm totally with so, you. So okay. yeah, I've used that method in quite fracturing and reconstructing or reconstituting imagery. Oh, that's really good. So you fracture. You have a holistic image. So this is even more bi. Biological. Yes, okay. very much so. So fracturing and reconstituting is a big part of the work. And again, I think that goes, it just fits in with the notion of uh, print and pattern and representation of cultures through, through you know, oh, how we I adorn see. ourselves. Yeah. How we adorn ourselves is really interesting. Yeah, and this one is totally whacked. I love it. <laughs> this one's like completely up my alley. And, um, and this one definitely looks very floral That's, to me. It is, but it's a Native American. Uh, the one icon is Native American. It's, this. it's an eyeball. Oh, And then it's yes, repeated yes. and then joined and a stencil is made. I use automotive stencils, low-tack automotive stencils to cut and block and save parts of the painting. So, um, the outside edge is uh, a line, a line taken from Papua New Guinea, the Azmat totem builders. Mm. Um, and if you go to the Met, you'll see their whole collection of Azmat totems. They're beautiful, and they were very accomplished linear sculptors. Wow! Using the line, and when I did more sculpture work, the line, like Nancy Graves was really important if you read some of her literature about the line in sculpture, which is not talked about very much. It's mostly talked about form. Mm -hmm. 
Um, but there are linear sculptors, people that build form using line, or mm -hmm. where line becomes predominant. And, wow. So and this it, one's actually more rooted than in uh, indigenous cultures. Well, it's a mashup. <laughs> it's a pretty big mashup. But it so. reads the very bi you know, biological and botanical. I hope so. Yeah. yeah. And so, yeah. it's it, despite the irrespective of the color. Um, but yeah, now I'm seeing yeah this. After hearing you talk, I'm reading this now very differently. The red, this sort of red orange. But again, this is like a frame and a frame. So. Definitely. So there's you know, multi multiple framing devices going on. And, and not all of them are this complex. Uh, some of them are just a single. There's one around the corner. There was an earlier one in the show that has no border at all. But it does have an interior sort of bordering. Exactly. So um, and that must have been sort of been the nugget that led you then to kind of move to the more physical border. That's true. I think the, the physical border is quite good. I, I really Thank like you. that. Thanks. And um, it really pushes it into the painting, you know, uh, realm um, with the, you know, the richness of the, of the colors and everything, but they're so smooth. The surfaces are just incredibly uh, smooth from the sanding. This one uh, is different, as we've already pointed out, but, um, but this is a good example of where you clearly sanded down quite a bit mm. to really reveal the un in the underpainting. That's correct. Very distinct. Uh, designs that peek through because when the gel medium is in its more raw state, it's more abstracted. That's it's, true. It's not as defined. That's correct. So, um, so that you know, it gives you a, a lot of opportunity for playing with, with the uh, elements mm -hmm. in this. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, I want to move to. We'll kind of cut here. We're going to refocus the camera because I would like to go to the other two on the, uh, two okay. of the ones on the other side and ask you a few things about that.